For the second year in a row, the Baltimore Orioles have the number one preseason prospect in baseball. And this time it's Gunnar Henderson and the Orioles names all over these top 100 prospect lists. We'll talk about that plus some other Orioles news and notes coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Monday, January 23rd, 2023. And welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb. And coming up on today's episode, we got a little Orioles news and notes to get to. We'll talk about the O's latest minor league signing, bringing in the right-handed pitcher, Reed Garrett. We'll talk about the O's in the Baseball America and Baseball Prospectus Top 100 Prospect lists from last week, with eight Orioles showing up in each list. And then we'll talk a bit about the Pablo Lopez trade. Of course, the Orioles didn't get him. Marlon sent him to the Twins. And we'll talk about why, after looking through that deal, the Orioles just really never would have been able to get Pablo Lopez from the Marlins. But that's all coming up on this episode of the Locked on Orioles podcast, which is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started today. So let's jump right into it. Orioles news and notes here on a Monday to kick off your week on the podcast. We are less than a month away from spring training starting. I mean, we are super close to pitchers and catchers reporting. And although the O's still haven't made the giant move, and although, you know, it still feels like we're we're obviously in football season at this point and other things, baseball is inching closer here week by week. And again, the O's haven't made the big move yet, but they did add another pitcher on a minor league deal last week. And that pitcher is Reed Garrett, who the Orioles signed to a minor league contract late last week. Now, Garrett, he's going to be behind the eight ball a little bit. He does have a little bit of big league experience, but we know the Orioles have probably a top 10 bullpen in baseball right now. And it's going to be hard to crack a spot in that bullpen. I've talked about it on this show multiple times that you could argue right now, if the Orioles don't add another legit pitcher, there's really only one spot in the bullpen up for grabs if everyone stays healthy. And if the Orioles do add either a Michael Waka or a top end starter via trade, You could almost sort of solidify their pitching staff going into opening day. You know, that's how good some guys have been. But Reed Garrett is going to come in and compete for a spot. Garrett, a 30 year old right hander, stands at six foot two, who was a 16th round pick of the Texas Rangers back in 2014. Again, he won't be on the 40 man roster, just on a minor league deal, but will get the invite to big league spring training and does have two minor league options left as well if he does ever get to the big leagues with the Orioles. Now, Garrett did pitch a little bit in the bigs last season. Seven appearances out of the pen for the Washington Nationals in 2022. Now, the Nationals in 2022 kind of operated like the Orioles in 2018 and 19, where anybody could come along and get a few relief appearances in their big league career. Now, it didn't go great for Garrett in the bigs last year. Seven appearances in nine and a third innings. He had a 6.75 ERA for the Nats. In those nine and a third innings, he allowed seven runs on 13 hits, six strikeouts to eight walks, a hit batter, and a home run allowed. Was basically pitching fully in mop-up duty uh, a little bit at the beginning of the season and then came up when rosters expanded as well for the Nationals. Now, you dive a little deeper into the numbers and they will tell you that there was one horrendous appearance and then he was pretty much fine other than that. On July 5th, Against the Phillies, Garrett gave up five earned runs on four hits while allowing three walks in just two-thirds of an inning in Philadelphia. He didn't give up more than one run in any other appearance throughout the other six on the year. So again, when you have a small sample size, just nine and a third innings, you have that one blow-up appearance that makes the numbers look a lot, lot worse. So he was a little bit better than at least the ERA showed. Now, obviously, a much bigger sample size for Garrett in AAA last year, where he was really good in the Nationals farm system, 42 bullpen appearances in AAA in 47 and a third innings. Garrett had a 3.04 ERA with a 3.78 FIP in AAA, a 27% strikeout rate, which is well above league average, to just a 9% walk rate, which is right around league average. Made it a pretty good year out of the AAA bullpen for a then 29-year-old 
Reed Garrett. So it was obviously something to build on. Now, he did have a little bit of previous AAA experience, or I should say major league experience, had a lot of AAA experience, but some previous major league experience before this year. And that was back in 2019 when he made his major league debut with the Detroit Tigers. He had gotten drafted by Texas in 2014 and just he got to AAA actually in 2016 with the Rangers, but just could not get himself to the big leagues 2016, 2018, 2019, long spurts in AAA with the Rangers, just could never push through to the bigs. Finally got to Detroit and got the chance. He got 13 appearances out of the Tigers bullpen in 2019, 15 and a third innings. And again, didn't go great. An 8.22 ERA in those 15 and a third innings for Garrett, who uh, in those 15 and a third innings, 24 hits, 10 strikeouts and 13 walks. Again, it was not pretty, but he does have a little bit of time in the big leagues. Now you're asking, why would the Orioles bring him in? Well, first of all, again, it's a minor league contract. It's zero risk to the Orioles. And the other thing is, the stuff is still interesting. It's a four-pitch mix, but it's a really interesting mix. It starts with a big fastball. He is definitely a big fastball guy. The righty Average is 96. He's consistently up at 97, 98 with that four seam fastball, which he's thrown pretty much more than half the time in his big league career. The number two pitch is classified as a cutter, but it almost works more like a hard slider at times, kind of 88 to 90 with that cutter. That's been his strikeout pitch in his career, throws it mostly to lefties to kind of jam them, but will also throw it away to righties as well. He, he tosses in a sinker at times at 95, and he does throw a splitter at about 88 to 89 miles an hour, kind of a power splitter to go with that fastball. You'll really never see him throw a pitch that's slower than maybe like 86 miles an hour. That's what makes it an interesting four-pitch mix for Reed Garrett. But what he does have is the big fastball that he can throw up in the zone. And the cutter and splitter are an interesting mix that maybe the Orioles will want to work with in AAA Norfolk and see if they can turn him back into a maybe a little more competitive and productive productive big league reliever but just another depth arm to have again I wouldn't be surprised if he just stuck in Norfolk all year was just bullpen depth and never pitched in the bigs with the Orioles but again on these minor league deals they're never a bad idea you can never have too much depth especially when it comes to pitching having in AAA just in case anything is needed especially with a guy who despite not having much success has pitched in the big leagues before but you know, Reed Garrett at 30 years old in AAA isn't going to show up on any prospect lists at this point, but that's okay because the Orioles have plenty of guys who will. As Baseball America and Baseball Prospectus announced their top 100 preseason prospect lists for the 2023 season late last week, and the Orioles had eight players in the top 100 on each list, including Gunnar Henderson as the number one prospect at both sides. We'll break down who the players are on the list, how the Orioles acquired these guys, and what it means as the O's continue to build up this player development process as they move forward and start to turn these wins in the minors into wins at the major league level as well. But first, this episode of the Locked on Orioles podcast is brought to you by FanDuel. The NFL playoffs are here. We're really excited about our new sports betting partner for Locked On because they're the number one sports book in America, and that's FanDuel. And if you're new to FanDuel, that's even better. They have so many great features that make betting on sports fun and easy. And new customers, you can join today to get started with $150 in free bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. Just sign up at FanDuel.com slash Locked On. FanDuel has all your favorite bets from the money line to point spreads to player props. And plus, you can even combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with a same game parlay. And now we've got the conference championship weekend coming up in the NFL, although here on a Monday it seems a little early to look at those lines and place a bet, at least for me. But what I'm looking at is the baseball bets at FanDuel and the Orioles World Series odds. They are plus 6,000 here at this point to win the World Series. So if you put a little money on the Orioles, well, you could uh, definitely cash out at the end of the season. But the O's do have better odds than the Red Sox to win the 2023 World Series on FanDuel, which is what I like to hear. And listen, it is all on an app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. So football fans, baseball fans, whatever, 
you may like to watch it bet on. Don't miss out. Place your first $5 bet to get $150 in free bets, win or lose, at fanduel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, the official sportsbook partner of the NFL. So we're getting to some Orioles news and notes here on a Monday episode. And obviously the big news for the Orioles from last week, besides John Angelos, you know, saying that nothing is appropriate on MLK Day, is that the prospect lists came out from two of the big publications, Baseball America and Baseball Prospectus. I would put those two along with fan graphs as kind of the top three places I go for national prospect rankings. And both places put out their top 100 prospect lists in terms of their preseason list for the 2023 campaign. And wouldn't you know it, the Orioles just dominating these lists. O's having eight players on each of the lists. That was the league lead for both of those lists. And sure enough, the number one prospect in both places was once again Gunnar Henderson. And for the first time, and it seems like maybe only one team has ever had this happen, the Orioles in back-to-back years have the preseason number one prospect. Of course, it was Adley Rutschman this time last year, and this year it is Gunnar Henderson, number one on both lists. Now, on the Baseball America list, this is how it shook out. Gunnar Henderson at number one, and the only other top 10 prospect was Grayson Rodriguez. Baseball America had him ranked number six as the second best pitching prospect in baseball. They had Andrew Painter of the Phillies ranked number five, so basically had the two neck and neck. Jackson Holiday, the Orioles' number one pick from 2022, ranked at number 15 by Baseball America. Then they had Colton Kowser at number 41, D.L. Hall at 75, Jordan Westberg at 76, and then bunched together right at the bottom, Connor Norby at number 93, and Joey Ortiz, just like he showed up on the Fangraphs list late last year, popping onto the Baseball America list at number 95 to round out those eight in the top 100 for the Orioles. And it was fairly similar over at Baseball Prospectus in that Gunnar Henderson, number one prospect over there as well. Now, they had Grayson Rodriguez a little lower, but still had him number eight. But they did have Jackson Holiday up at number nine, giving the Orioles three of the top nine prospects in all of baseball, according to Baseball Prospectus. That is pretty good. They then had Colton Kowser a little bit higher at number 38. And then the biggest difference between Baseball America and Baseball Prospectus is that Baseball America did not rank Kobe Mayo, but Prospectus ranked him at number 69. They actually had Mayo ranked as the Orioles' number five prospect, whereas some places don't even have Kobe Mayo in their top 10 for the Orioles. So interesting that baseball prospect is really high on Kobe Mayo, putting him at number 69. Then they had Jordan Westberg at number 74, kind of in the same spot. Connor Norby up a little higher at number 82. They're a little lower on DL Hall with baseball prospect is having him at number 95 to round out their top 100. Now, the big difference was, as I mentioned, Mayo on the prospectus list, Joey Ortiz not on the baseball prospectus list. He was number 95 on Baseball America's list. But Baseball Prospectus did put out kind of those next crop of guys from, you know, 101 to 130 that they were considering. And they did mention Joey Ortiz, Heston Kerstad, and Dylan Beavers in that list. So you add those three guys as well. You've got 11 of the Orioles prospects who are mentioned in these lists in some way, shape, or form. You've got some teams with one guy, maybe two guys on this list. The Orioles have 11 in some of the mentionings and eight of the top 100 on both sides. And I think what makes this really exciting is that, A, a lot of these Orioles guys are close to the big leagues, if not already in the big leagues. You know, as we know, Gunnar Henderson and D.L. Hall have already made their Major League debuts late last year. They will both be on the opening day roster, and shortly into the season, Gunner and D.L. Hall will both graduate from prospect status off these lists. You have to think Grayson Rodriguez will as well. I mean, all signs point to him having an opening day starting rotation spot for the Orioles, so after a couple months, he will lose prospect status. He will graduate off the list. And then the other guys out there, I mean – Colton Kowser, Jordan Westberg, Connor Norby, Joey Ortiz, they're all going to start the year in AAA Norfolk. They all ended the year in Norfolk. Heck, one of them, I mean, there's an outside chance Westberg could make the Orioles opening day roster. I don't think he does, but they will all be starters in the AAA lineup. And I mean, you would think if none of them are traded, 
most, if not all those guys are going to appear in the big leagues this year with the O's and some could even graduate from prospect status late in the year. So you're really only looking at, you know, Jackson holiday, who obviously won't appear in the bigs this year. And then Kobe Mayo, who was set back a little bit by injuries last year. So he'll probably start the year at double a buoy again. I think if all goes well, he will be in triple a Norfolk this year. I don't see Mayo getting to the big leagues in 2023. And then, of course, you have Heston Kerstad, who will probably start at double-A and could get to triple-A, and Dylan Beavers, who I think will probably end the year at double-A, the Orioles' second pick uh, in the 2022 draft. So those guys won't be in the big leagues this year, but a lot of these guys could graduate in 2023. And that's one of the huge things is that it's not you know this deep prospect pool where everybody's in single-A, where you're right at the beginning of a rebuild. No, no, no. You've got all these top prospects who are ready this year to contribute to a team that just won 83 games and is trying to get better and get to the postseason. So that's all positive things. Now, the Orioles obviously probably should have, in terms of legitimate, proven Major League talent, added some more this offseason. There's still some time to do that. We'll get to that in a bit as well. But these 11 names being on here is really exciting, and it shows that you know the Orioles, I mean, definitely have a top five system and great argument to be made that the Orioles still have the number one system in – all of baseball. And you look at, you know, what could happen next year, but the fact that Jackson holiday is already, you know, number 15 on the baseball America list and number nine on the baseball prospectus list. Again, he's not getting to the big leagues this year. There's no chance. I think he probably spends a little time in Delmarva, then goes to Aberdeen and he'll probably finish a good chunk of the year at double a buoy. As long as all goes well for Jackson holiday. I mean, there's a really good chance. He is the number one prospect on both of these lists at this time next year which would give the Orioles three straight years with the number one prospect and have it be three different players with Rutschman, then Henderson, and then potentially Holiday on the 2024 preseason list. And that's how this system continues to get good. And I got to say, you know, John Mioli and Nathan Ruiz each wrote about this last week, which was a good point as well. Obviously, Holiday is the number one candidate, but I mean, there's a good chance Colton Kowser is still prospect eligible this time next year. You know, the O's could hold him down in AAA. You know, I would think he gets to the bigs this year, but maybe it's like Gunnar Henderson, not enough time. If that's the case, heck, you know, Gunnar Henderson was number 57 on the list this time last year and now is number one. Colton Kowser could easily go from number 41 to number one on the Baseball America list if he has a great year and just barely doesn't get enough plate appearances in the big league. So they've really got two options that could be number one this time next year. And I think, you know, the biggest takeaway besides the fact that these guys are so close to the big leagues, some of them already in the big leagues and have already showed off talent at the big league level, this farm system continues to be deep, is that all the guys who were ranked, you know, nine different players were ranked, plus Beavers and Kerstad, who I mentioned, all 11 of these guys were drafted by the Orioles. None of these players I'm mentioning were guys who you know came over in trades, and nine of the eleven were drafted by Mike Elias. You know the only two on here who weren't were Dan Duquette's final two first round picks when he got DL Hall in the first round in 2017, and then Grayson Rodriguez in the first round in 2018, both pitchers out of high school. But the other nine guys are all Mike Elias draft picks, and you've got Gunnar Henderson who was their second pick in the 2019 draft. Jackson Holiday, of course, number one overall. Colton Kowser, number five overall. Jordan Westberg, a you know compensation round pick. Connor Norby, a second round pick. Joey Ortiz was a fourth round pick. Kobe Mayo, a fourth round pick as well. And then Dylan Beavers, a second round pick. And then Heston Kerstad, of course, the number two overall pick, who you know I think is definitely higher on these lists and, and on these lists have not for you know the health issues that he had early and then the injury issues in 2022 as well. But this Orioles team, I mean, we're at a point where I think we can fully trust Mike Elias and his staff to draft and develop these players that they're getting high in the draft and some of the guys they're getting low in the draft as well. And it also does kind of add to a point I've made on this podcast before, which is that, you know, the O's have this amazing list, you know, eight guys on the top 100, 11 guys mentioned. That's a great amount of players. There's just not room for all these guys to contribute for the Orioles. Too many of them play the same position. It's just not going to happen. So you're going to have to trade some of these guys away to get big league talent. And that's the other thing. It's not just the one side of the Orioles, you know, they don't have room to play these guys. Might as well capitalize on their value and get big leaders. But the other side of it is, look how great the O's have been at drafting. All of these guys on this list were drafted by the Orioles. Look how good they are at drafting. There is a draft every year with 20 rounds. 
you get to get 20 plus new players into the system every year, no matter what, with those draft picks. So if you trade those guys away, it's okay because I trust my class and I hope you do as well to add more and more depth and more talent to the system in those drafts year after year after year. Remember that, you know, you trade away prospects, you get some more in the draft the next year. And if Michael Elias keeps drafting this well, the O's are going to keep churning guys out. So it's okay to trade some of those prospects away, but man, there's a lot of talent on these lists. But speaking of trades, including prospects as well, there was a big trade that went down over the weekend. And it involved a guy the Orioles were certainly pursuing, the right-hander Pablo Lopez from the Marlins. But instead, he goes to the Twins. And coming up next to finish off the pod, we'll talk about why that trade went down and why, when you look at that trade, you realize the Orioles probably never had a true shot at Lopez if this is what they were after in return. So to finish things off today, wanted to talk about the big trade of the weekend. One of the bigger trades, you could argue maybe the biggest trade that's happened this offseason in Major League Baseball. As the Twins and the Marlins made a deal with the Marlins sending Pablo Lopez to Minnesota, along with prospects Jose Salas and Byron Churio, they go to the Twins and the Marlins get the infielder Luis Arise back in the deal. Now, it was really interesting because it was a deal that there'd been murmurs about it. It broke that it was just a rise for Lopez. Then it turns out that the Marlins had thrown in two prospects, Minnesota's way as well. And the deal is, it's interesting because in Pablo Lopez, the Twins get a legitimate major league starting pitcher, maybe not a number one, but definitely a number two or number three in your rotation, a guy who you get for for two years. You know, he's a free agent after 2024 and you can negotiate a, a deal with him. And then you get two prospects, Jose Salas, was the Marlins' number three prospect, a 19-year-old shortstop. He now slots in as Minnesota's number 13-ranked prospect on MLB.com. Yeah, he's not a top 100 guy, but he is a projects to be at least a good player, an international signing from 2019, good big left-handed hitter. And then they get Byron Churio, who's more of a, a lottery ticket, a 17-year-old outfielder who was playing in the Dominican Summer League this year. It was his first season of pro ball in 2022. But they get a couple young players, and they get Pablo Lopez. Now, they did have to give away a great player in Luis Arise, who won the batting title in the American League this year with the Twins, hit 316, had a 131 WRC plus, 3.2 fan graphs war for the Twins in 2022. He has three years of control left. He's not a free agent until after 2025. So the Marlins get a good hitter for three more years. But just looking at the trade first, I, I still haven't come up with my full feeling on this trade because... The Marlins obviously needed bats. Their lineup is terrible. And Luis Arise helps. I mean, he's a hit machine. He's one of the toughest outs in baseball. I'm never quite scared Arise is going to homer off of me all the time. But I feel like he's just impossible to get out. He doesn't strike out. He makes so much contact. And he hits for average. It's a really good combination. On the flip side, he's not great defensively. And the Marlins said he's going to play second base. But honestly, he's become kind of a lousy second baseman. And, you know, he's basically played a lot of first base and was a little better there for the twins, but not a great infielder, but you know, the bat makes up for it definitely at times. And you look at that and you say, well, why would the twins give that up? He's one of the toughest outs. Well, they did get Carlos Correa back in their infield and they do need starting pitching. It's been the thing that's kind of brought them down over the last few years and getting Pablo Lopez, I think is a really good guy to, to help anchor that rotation. And you get two prospects as well. And one guy in Salas who, people think could be really, really good in the big league. So I get it from that side. And from the Marlins side, I get it. You're getting a big league hitter, but I mean, how much does Luis Arise really help the Marlins? Cause their lineup is in dire straits. And you also give up two prospects as well. And Pablo Lopez. I don't know. I, I, I don't think it's a lose lose. It's certainly not a win win. I'm not really sure what this trade is, but I want to bring it up because it definitely impacts the Orioles because as we've talked about throughout really the last two years, Paulo Lopez was certainly a trade target for the Orioles trying to add to that starting rotation. I mean, we've done multiple episodes this over the past year, including earlier this off season with arm Layton about, you know, what it would take for the Orioles to give up to Miami to get not just a starting pitcher, but specifically Pablo Lopez was kind of the number one name that gets thrown around by media and, and Orioles fans when it comes to trying to trade for a legitimate starting pitcher with team control. It seemed to be always Pablo Lopez, Pablo Lopez, Pablo Lopez. And while he's not an ace, I think he could be a really good number two or number three, you know, even a number two pitcher 
in you know your rotation. That's what the Twins are hoping for in making this deal. But I tweeted this out via the Locked On Orioles account when the trade was made over the weekend. And when you really break down this trade, you kind of realize why the Orioles weren't the team that ended up with Pablo Lopez. For the Marlins to go get Luis Arise, not get anything else from Minnesota, and give up two prospects, one who was a top five prospect in their system, to go get Luis Arise in this deal. That tells you that in Pablo Lopez trades, not only were they shopping Lopez around, but they wanted established, controllable big league hitters with a good amount of control. In terms of established, controllable big league hitters, who obviously aren't like rookie phenoms, the Orioles, you could argue, really only have two of those guys who they would even consider trading at all on the roster. And those two guys would be Anthony Santander and Cedric Mullins. And... For Santander, you're looking at a guy who you know only has two more years of control and is essentially a DH right now. I mean, it did not look good for him in the outfield defensively. That's something we've talked about. And he still has only had one full healthy season. Now, it was this year, and he was really good in 2022. But Arise has a much better track record, and Arise has a full extra year of control over Santander. So really, the only player that compares to arise in this kind of deal would have been Cedric Mullins. And that was a name that was thrown out there that you know, the Marlins were interested in. And people talked about trade, you know, where maybe it could just be Mullins for Lopez one for one. Well, clearly if the Orioles did give up Mullins, they would have gotten a couple of prospects along with Pablo Lopez in that deal. But the O's, I feel like have made it clear. They're not looking to trade Cedric Mullins. They got three more years of him. I think they're going to extend Mullins to be honest. He's been such a productive player. It's really hard to replace that defensive talent with the speed, with the ability to hit to all fields, with the sneaky power, with the great season he had in 2021, it's hard to replace a player like that. I just don't think the Orioles are willing basically at all to trade Cedric Mullins. And when you look at a rise and then you look at the Orioles roster, it seems like the Marlins were keying in on established hitters with extra control. And Cedric Mullins really only fits that mold perfectly on this Orioles roster, and they didn't want to trade it. So you have to think that's probably where trade talks between the Orioles and the Marlins have broken down. And, you know, Rockabaco reported last week that the Orioles were still engaging with Miami in trade talks. But I'm assuming the Marlins kept asking for Cedric Mullins, and the Orioles said no. And now the Marlins were able to get Luis Arise, but they just weren't able to get Cedric Mullins. And so, you know, we could churn up all these trades where maybe you include a Jordan Westberg or a Joey Ortiz or a Connor Norby or even a Colton Cowser, or maybe they want, you know, Ramon Arias or guys like that or a Kyle Stowers. But none of those guys fit the mold of Luis Arise because, yeah, Norby or Westberg or Ortiz or even Cowser, they could be great big league hitters, but none of them have ever played in the majors yet. And, you know, a a guy like Kyle Stowers or a guy like Ramon Arias, you know, they haven't gotten the best chances yet, but they could break out maybe on another team, but they haven't broken out yet. That's the thing about Arise. He's established. He's been an all-star. He's won a batting title. He's already done his breakout. You know what he is as a big league hitter. And it kind of comes down to, yeah, it's some that the Orioles don't want to give up a player like Mullins, but it's also... The Marlins cannot develop hitters. We've seen it time and time again. Every hitter they bring in as a prospect, whether via the draft or via trade, basically fails. They can't develop hitters. So at this point, I don't blame them for being like, we want not just major league hitters, established, already developed major league hitters. So they don't even want a Kyle Stowers or a Ramon Arias because there's more work to be done on those two guys before they're established big leaguers. There's no work to be done on Luis Arise. You know what he is, a really tough out who doesn't strike out, who hits for average and gets himself on base. Cedric Mullins really only kind of fits that role, basically, for the Orioles, and they didn't want to trade him. So the Marlins didn't want Jordan Westberg because they're scared they were going to fail at developing him and lose this trade again. And they gave up extra prospects just to make sure they could get that established big leaguer. That's how desperate they are for a hitter because they can't develop one themselves. So maybe the O's can still make a trade with Miami. You know, you have pitchers like Edward Cabrera and Jesus Lazardo who have even more team control and I think could be super helpful to the O's rotation. And a trade could still be made where the Orioles do send a younger hitter. But if the Marlins were going to trade away their established starting pitcher in Pablo Lopez, they definitely wanted an established, established bat. 
And it could just mean that it was just about Pablo Lopez. It also could mean that the Marlins are looking for that kind of return in any trade. And maybe that means the Orioles and Marlins just aren't going to make this kind of hitter for pitcher trade we've been talking about for years that they should make because they just can't develop a hitter to save their lives. And I think that's what it came down to. They didn't want anyone but Mullins because they were scared they would break anybody else. And the O's smartly weren't willing to give Mullins up. And I think that's where they landed. And that's why Pablo Lopez is now with the Minnesota Twins. But that'll do it for today's episode. We thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure to like and subscribe wherever you listen. Like, comment, and subscribe to the Locked on Orioles podcast on YouTube as well. As we'll be back for two more episodes later this week here on the pod. Be back on Wednesday talking all things Orioles. Hey, hopefully John Angelos actually opens up the books this week. and We can chat about those O's financials coming up on Wednesday. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked on Orioles podcast part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.